Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of the United States and the Cold War. In the previous lecture, we talked about the growing war of words between the two sides and the rivalry as it escalated in the months and the first year or so after the end of World War II. I concluded by noting that President Harry Truman was relatively quiet in those first months of the Cold War throughout 1946. In this lecture, we'll turn to the growing role that Truman played in enunciating an important policy in those early months and years of the Cold War, a policy known as containment. In early 1947, Truman made his feelings known when he said, one way of life is based upon the will of the majority and is distinguished by free institutions, representative government, free elections, guarantees of individual liberty, freedom of speech and religion, and freedom from political oppression. The second way of life is based upon the will of a minority forcibly imposed upon the majority. It relies upon terror and oppression a controlled press and radio, fixed elections, and the suppression of personal freedoms. So what would be Truman's policy and course of action carrying forward with this mindset? The first major American policy in these early stages of the Cold War was known as containment. The policy was first articulated by a man named George Kennan, a United States ambassador to the Soviet Union, who for much of this period lived in Moscow and was, so to speak, in the belly of the beast, observing developments in that part of the world. In February 1946, Kennan began explaining his ideas in what was known as the Long Telegram, a telegram sent back from Russia to the State Department. It was later published in a more formal way in Foreign Affairs as the X article. It was published without an author credited, but eventually most of those in the know understood that this was George Kennan's work. In the long telegram and the X article, Kennan explained that the Soviets feared capitalist encirclement, that the Soviet Union would not change its ideas or stop its advance around the globe. So the United States must make every effort to contain that advance anywhere possible. This, broadly speaking, is the idea known as containment. It rested on the assumption enunciated by Kennan that the Soviets sought world domination and they wouldn't stop unless the United States stopped them. Now, I should note that at this early juncture, Kennan was not emphasizing military containment. He wasn't suggesting that the United States send troops to every corner of the world. But rather, this was philosophical, economic, uh, boosting up morale in nations at the perimeter. It would come to others not long down the line to incorporate a military component in this idea of containment. Kennan wrote in the long telegram, impervious to logic or reason, the Soviet regime is highly sensitive to the logic of force. The next step in containment came on March 12, 1947, in a speech that Harry Truman gave in Congress. This was made based on a dispute over Russian influence in Greece and Turkey, who were asking for aid to support them, an issue that I talked about in a previous lecture. For those who wonder why even now, it is often the United States who plays a role in global issues where they might otherwise remain out of it. This idea of the United States as sort of a watchdog for the entire world or policing the world against various problems. In some ways, it is this speech that established that doctrine, the Truman Doctrine. In his speech, Truman said, the seeds of totalitarian regimes are nurtured by misery and want. 
They spread and grow in the evil soil of poverty and strife. They reach their full growth when the hope of a people for a better life has died. We must keep that hope alive. I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or outside pressures. In other words, it should be the role of the United States to be patrolling the planet for issues and problems and to intervene whenever possible. This, in some form or fashion, remains American policy even today, and it would become a linchpin of American policy throughout the Cold War. The Cold War was also waged on the economic front. And the first major policy or plan on that front is known as the Marshall Plan, the economic plan to help the nations of Europe rebuild. The plan was laid out and enunciated by Secretary of State George Marshall, who in 1947 gave the commencement address at Harvard, and it was in that speech that he laid out the formula for this plan. If European nations reconstructed themselves with aid from the United States, it would discourage communism from growing in those nations. This is one of the key examples of the economic front of the Cold War, the United States wielding money and economic influence and trade to strengthen its ties with some nations and thereby discourage communism in those nations. So according to the Marshall Plan, the United States would offer aid to European nations. Now, there were some strings attached. There would be openness in the sharing of economic plans. And it was understood that those kind of strings would discourage the Soviet Union from joining this plan. It also called for European nations to trade with the United States over the Soviet Union. By 1952, the United States had given more than $30 billion for the economic recovery of Europe. And so one might wonder, did it work? Well, in many ways, it certainly helped. Europe did recover in the aftermath of the war, and the United States established strong allies, at least in portions of Western Europe. On the downside, much of this aid eventually became military aid, and thus it contributed to the military buildup of the Cold War, and in some ways intensified the rivalry with the Soviets. Again, an issue that we'll be discussing in future lectures. The Marshall Plan had long and deep influence over the global economy. It called, for instance, for the coal industry in Europe to be modernized. The United States would help European nations in terms of technology, improving productivity. But the United States began to view Europe as an entire economic community, beginning to break down the divisions and the national borders in Europe and to unify it. Each of the participants was called to produce what it was best at and was most efficient at, leaving other countries to produce other goods. This ultimately lowered cost of almost everything in Europe, creating in some ways a United States of Europe. This was the beginning of an overall European identity, overwhelming a Belgian or Dutch or French or German identity. It was believed that a European political union might follow. This was based on the experience of the United States, which, if you recall, originated as a series of colonies that were independent from each other, in many ways separated from each other, and ultimately came together to form the United States. The United States had survived because we created a common market. Unity was the key to prosperity. In the United States, one could travel freely to any state and ship goods freely across borders. This was the ultimate vision of the Marshall Plan in Europe. As a related development, the United States also proposed the creation of an alliance system that would become the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. This would be anchored by 
United States military might and power. In essence, the United States would defend all of the members of NATO and would confront any prospective enemy of the European Union. This was relying on the fact that at that time, the American military possessed the atomic bomb and in fact had a monopoly on the atomic bomb at that point. And so there was essentially no one in the world who could threaten and challenge American power. As we'll see, of course, that would not always be the case throughout the Cold War. Another important development of the Marshall Plan was that similar ideas were extended to Southeast Asia. Eventually, a similar organization was created in Southeast Asia, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, or CETO. And there as well, the United States would defend Southeast Asia, resting on the might of the at atomic bomb, which perhaps ironically, this was the site of the dropping of the first atomic bombs. But in relatively short order after the war, it was now the American atomic bomb that would defend Southeast Asia, including Japan. The United States insisted on the new Japanese constitution abandoning all weapons, at least temporarily. The United States would use the full American might to protect Japan. And so a defense budget temporarily was deleted from Japan and they could focus all of their economic growth in other areas like technology. Some have pointed out that perhaps in the long run, this plan might have backfired because Japan did indeed begin pouring its money into the growth of new technologies. And if we think about later economic developments, it's Japan that came to dominate many industries like radios, technology, televisions, early computers, and so on. As Marshall said in part during his speech, this is the business of the Europeans. The initiative, I think, must come from Europe. But make no mistake, one important aspect of the Marshall Plan is that those very European nations became much more dependent on the United States. They depended on us for defense and the atomic bomb, and we depended on them for their economic development and trade. So far, we've talked about the growing Cold War as primarily a war of words and philosophies and economies. In the next lectures, we'll turn to the growing Cold War as a military development as well. Mm -hmm.